Thank you very much. I appreciate the real kindness of that introduction. Uh, after a foggy morning, it's kind of good to have, uh, I was going to say clarity, but perhaps more fog is also in line. Can you hear me in the back right now? OK, I'm artificially amplified, but I can't tell if my beard has eaten the microphone or not. <laughs> so either it has, and you're playing a terrible joke on me, or nodding, but we're all OK. Good, good. Uh, I want to thank Penn State, uh, COIL in particular, uh, for inviting me to come here. I really appreciate the chance to get to know so many splendid people doing so many unusual projects. Uh, what I'd like to do today is take you on a tour of the future. Now, your dean has just mentioned that it is really not as interesting to predict the future as it is to invent it, and she's quite right. What I'd like to do is to give you a way to think about the future, and then I'd like to give you some goads, some prompts to help you invent and shape the future. Now, as we go, a quick show of hands. How many of you are Twittering right now? That's pretty good. That's a healthy amount. Excellent. You all know the hashtag, right? Which is uh, WCFC14. Is that right? So please use that, uh, unless you want to just be stealthy and have no one watch your tweets, which is OK if you want to do that. How many of you are using some other social media service right now besides Twitter? What are you using? Facebook, Google Plus? LinkedIn. LinkedIn, who's doing that? Awesome, very good. A man of taste and discernment, very good. <laughs> um, as we go, I sometimes present and have another window open with uh, Twitter just to have it going. I'm not doing that today, uh, in part because what I'd like to show you uh, is going to be both, I hope, stimulating and also terrifying. I found that over the past couple of years, indeed since uh, 2008, when I speak to people about the future, increasingly, they would like to hear what is going to happen that will scare them. They're interested in what could possibly go wrong. And I find that an interesting sign of where higher education is. Now, partly it's fun and it's entertaining, but also it's a sign that we live in very, very strange times. If you want to learn, I believe 2014 is the best time in human history. If you want to teach or support teaching, this is a very challenging time. And many of our institutions are facing a very troubled time. Now, to proceed, what I'd like to do is first take you on a quick tour of trend lines in the present. That is, forces, events, energies that are happening right now that have a chance to influence the near and medium term future. After that, I'm going to offer four different scenarios of possible futures, each of which are somewhat grim. After that, a quick gesture at ways that you might be able to avoid those four bad futures. And then I want to hear from you. Now, after this, we have a discussion session, right, 10 o'clock? So if you don't have any ideas that we get to before 10, hold on to them and we can talk about them. Now, just so you know where this is coming from, Every month, I publish a report. Uh, it's an email newsletter right now called Future Trends in Technology and Education. It comes out and it surveys these major trend lines. It's broken down into a few categories, which I'll explain in a couple of seconds. I've been doing this for about three years. So we now have a longitudinal range where we can track these trends and see which of them have actually panned out into powerful, influential forces and which have really just stuttered and gone nowhere. It's really important, I think, to be clear about both. These are also crowdsourced. Every day, I hurl trend questions out through social media, primarily Google plus Twitter, and also to a lesser extent, Facebook, and get feedback. Here's a new story. What do you think? And people constantly throw ideas at me through all kinds of media. And then, if the ideas become larger, I blog about them and get conversation going and discussion rolling. Now, what I'd like to do is first touch on trend lines that impact education and its contexts, what's happening on campuses and in the immediate situation in which we live. So first, if we think about education in 2014, we're seeing a few things going on. Reform movements, whatever we think about them, if you want to put quotes around reform, fine. But reform movements have really ramped up in K through 12 as well as higher education. 
We're also seeing student debt rise. I, I think this is a cliche to talk about, but we know that the total amount of student debt is approximately $1.1 trillion. Trillions used to be real money back in the day. Um, but they really are, uh, and they surpass all consumer debt besides mortgages. We also know that alternative forms of certification are out there and being piloted. I know World Campus has a badge initiative, right? which is really unusual, and you guys should be committed for that. We're seeing badges, we're seeing assessment in new ways. We're also seeing competency-based learning, especially in public institutions. Now, we're also seeing higher education in the United States go global in some interesting ways. One is that we're seeing an increasing number of international students moving to the US. Let's see, do we have the Humphrey Scholars here? Where are you guys? Uh, they're uh, they're at, uh, in another city today. Wow. That's appropriate for world travelers. They can't stay in one place. <laughs> but we're seeing more and more of them, and uh, there are lots of reasons for this happening. I, I don't mean more and more Humphrey scholars, that may be, but more and more international students, especially in graduate school. Uh, one reason is American higher education retains a huge reputation globally. Another is, for reasons I'll get into, we desperately need more people, especially those who can pay full freight. At the same time, around the world, Colleges and university systems are being built up from Latin America to China to Europe to India. They're seeing the construction of more universities in China than any nation at any point in human history to date. We're seeing Europe, which actually is spending tons of euros on how to improve higher education. Anybody know about the Bologna process here? Oh, good, good. The rest of you should know that now it's possible through the European higher education zone where you can pass credits across multiple nations from Norway to Italy. We're also seeing about 400 campuses in the United States opening branch campuses of different shapes across the world from Singapore to the Middle East. We're also seeing an interesting glitch in an overall enrollment. The total number of students enrolled in higher education for the past three years has actually staggered, if not declined a bit. This is an ugly chart, I apologize for it. It's the only one that's out there. But if you take a look at it, you can see for sector through sector, the total number of students, the growth pattern has reversed. This is the first time this has happened in decades and decades. We don't know if this is gonna be a, a, a sign of a serious downward turn or if it's a brief pause or a plateau. One of my scenarios is predicated on this. We're also seeing the total number of adjuncts in higher education rise. Uh, in our lifetimes, we passed a major milestone where the majority of teaching, the majority of teachers in the higher education are part-time. That has never happened before in American history. And we did that, and that's where we live now. As far as I can tell, there are no countervailing forces to this. The proportion of university instruction done by adjuncts, as far as I can tell, will continue to grow. Uh, we know the, one of the major drivers behind adjunctification is the production of PhDs, and we know that there seems to be no pause in that. In fact, the Modern, Library, the Modern Languages Association issued a report saying that Research One universities should continue to produce the same number of PhDs. So, we should continue to expect this, I think. Now, it's important to know, when you look at the future, to look at predictions that didn't work out. And this chart is an embarrassment to me, although it is enormously entertaining. This chart describes, for each state in the United States, the highest paid state employee. And as you can tell, there is a kind of commonality across all of them. Now, my prediction was that in 2008, 2009, for various reasons, including, of course, events on this campus, that we might see colleges and universities cut back on, on athletic spending. Quite a few of us thought that. My alma mater, the University of Michigan, you may have heard of it, they have a uh, football team that's, um, it's okay. Um, its president declared that college sports were a beast that must be tamed. And we didn't do it. Quite the opposite, as you can see. Now, there, in the context, there are a few more details we should know before we go further. One is that the demographics in the United States have become very interesting and very strange. First, the proportion of people who are young, minors, age one to 18, has been declining. Not the rate of growth has been slowing, but actually going down in a bunch of American states, including the Midwest and the Northeast. We also know that the proportion of Americans who are seniors has been growing. In fact, this chart is unprecedented in American history. 
This is a demographic breakdown of uh, American society, and it's shaped by age groups, by five-year intervals. And the bottom pile, the bottom of the pile is the youngest, and the top is the oldest. This chart used to look like a sharp pyramid, you know, lots of babies, very few seniors. And now it's turning into something like a refrigerator. It's becoming square. We've never had this in America. We don't know what this means. Other societies, there are a few that have done this, notably some parts of Scandinavia and all of Japan. We're not sure how to proceed with this. This is a huge factor for education from K through 12 to graduate school. We also know that in the workplace, we've seen some extraordinary changes. One of the reasons I like to watch Mad Men is that, it, and I know most of you do too, is that it has this fantasy vision where someone goes to a job, works in their job, for life, <laughs> one job, and it's full time. <laughs> it's pretty good. Um, <laughs> that's not our time anymore. We live in what some people call the gig economy. Um, that is, we're seeing a shift from manufacturing to service. In the 1990s, we proclaimed that this would be an information economy. We were correct in terms of number of businesses. We were incorrect in terms of total amount of people. Very few people are actually involved in the information economy. They are primarily in the service economy, which is interesting. We're also seeing a shift from one person having one job, one career, one employer for life to the gig economy, multiple jobs, often part-time. In fact, by one estimate, currently one-third of Americans are now part-time workers. We're also seeing a declining proportion of Americans actually working. Eligible workers went up to almost 70% about 10 years ago, and it's been dropping closer to 61%. Along with this, we're seeing increasing automation of work functions everywhere from automated checkouts to self-driving cars. You may know this chart. Has anybody here read into Thomas Piketty's book, Capital in the 21st Century? Oh, well, you're either very brave or you have this book ahead of you. This is the famous book from this year, an economics classic that became a bestseller, where Piketty argues that this is the shape of economics in the, 20, in the 20th century and dictates the 21st. On the left, is a measure of inequality. And you can see on the very far left, 1910, 1920, the higher the curve, the greater the inequality. We are a fairly unequal society. This was the Gilded Age. Through World War II and after the Depression, inequality declined quite drastically. And you can see in the middle of the 20th century, we were a fairly equal society. Starting around 1975 or 1980, that reversed course, and as you can see, inequality has been growing ever since. This is supported by enormous reams of data and seems to describe the American economy in powerful ways. What this means, we can discuss. There were a few ideas that I was observing that have not appeared. Uh, one of them is that the idea that campuses would share services between themselves, that has not happened. Campuses, even those with financial stresses, would rather outsource to a third party provider then share with each other. We know that there were crises about executives on campuses getting paid too much in different schools, including Brandeis. Um, that hasn't had any impact. Uh, we still keep paying CFOs and, and presidents the same salaries. We seem, as a sector in higher education, to be comfortable with that. There were questions about interns being underpaid or not paid at all. Um, there hasn't been much traction on that. A lot of people in the futurist community, especially boomers, were expecting bitter intergenerational conflict to be erupting by now. When you think about the youth bearing huge amounts of debt, if you think about them facing a bad economy, that hasn't happened. Uh, it may be that a generation of teaching multiculturalism and tolerance has really paid off. So baby boomers, well done, well played. <laughs> We were also looking at library budgets, which are getting hammered hard in 2009, 2010, and uh, that really, generally speaking, hasn't really followed out. Libraries have, uh, are suffering in many ways, but they haven't been massacred like we thought could happen. Let's switch ground. Let's talk about technology and some trend lines in technology. And this picture is actually a nice little illustration. If you can just barely make it out, on the left, that little chip is 128 megabytes. On the right, that same size chip is held in 128 gigabytes. It's a nice little illustration of how quickly technology grows and develops. So here are a few trends that you want to think about. Top level trends. One is 
we have stacks that dominate information. So these are vertical silos, services that are linked together by one corporation. So for example, I can see an Apple desktop or a laptop there. We have the iOS universe of iPhone and iPad. You go to the iTunes store, you use the iPrefix for every damn thing, and you are happy. It is safe and secure you have that. Google has a similar stack with Google Play, its Google Play Store, the Chromebook NetTop, its Android operating system for mobile devices, which is the leading one in the world. Microsoft has one that no one talks about, but is still there. BlackBerry is desperately trying to keep its own going. We have stack after stack. And although we celebrate nominally open content, we seem to love our closed content universes and ecosystems. This is a big development. Second development. Back in the 1990s, a bunch of us were really obsessed with rumors that we were hearing about government agencies like the NSA collecting information in inappropriate ways. Nobody listened to us because they thought we were cranks. <laughs> now, after Snowden, the whole world has changed. Uh, in fact, um, Dr. Bogus made a, an, an, no, um, Andrew made a, uh, an NSA joke, and you can make NSA jokes, and people don't protest. You can say, oh, my PowerPoint's gone, but don't worry, the NSA has a copy of it. Everyone laughs, because we assume it's not literally true, but it's okay. And I have yet to see anybody stand up and say, that's incorrect, factually, or to say, that's unpatriotic to say. We're kind of accustomed to it now. So there's some interesting challenges. We're more creeped out about Facebook and Google collecting information than the NSA, which is interesting. So we have a whole new political environment about information. We're also seeing more complex ecosystems as we keep hammering out more devices and more machines. And on top of this, we continue to digitize. We don't talk about it, but we continue to digitize books, music, film. We continue our vast migration of the human race and its thinking into the digital sphere. We also love digital video. We keep making video, we love consuming it. Is anybody here working in the uh, network world right now? On campus? Networking, sysadmins, anybody? No, that's why I could tell you were all happy. Okay, you weren't. <laughs> but on most campuses, the major bandwidth hog, the major content that flows through the pipes is Netflix and video in general. And we still see more and more of that. We're comfortable with it. We used to talk about cloud computing like it was a big, exciting new thing, and then we stopped talking about it because we all use it, basically. We, can't, we are happy to upload lots of data and secure it with Google or with Facebook or with whomever right now. In fact, there are wars being fought between Amazon and IBM, very arcane, very geeky wars to see who can control the cloud space. Two more big levels. We have augmented reality, and that simply refers to taking digital content and tying it to the physical world. It can be as light as a GPS function for your phone, or it can be as heavy as being able to superimpose digital content on your face-to-face -face environment. We also keep seeing more artificial intelligence and automation grow. I was struck by the film, Her. You guys have all seen that? If you haven't, I really recommend it if you haven't. Uh, because among other things, it was a, kind of a first sign of Hollywood taking artificial intelligence seriously, even though it's not really that serious, and putting into intimate personal lives where we're accustomed to this. Uh, Apple users are happy to use Siri. We use speech recognition at many places. We've made major, major advances in artificial intelligence. If you're ever too frightened of it, I recommend going to YouTube and searching for the terms Siri and Scotsman. And you'll be guaranteed laughter, a speech recognition trying to understand Scots people speaking English. <laughs> social media, I, I mean, I've been talking about social media for quite some time. Um, and it's, for me, almost relaxing to see it more or less devour the entire world. We don't talk about Web 2.0 anymore because this is basically the web. If we have digital content that's not social, we have to remark upon it. We have to say, oh, that's angel. You know, it doesn't connect to the world. It doesn't have hooks to everything. It's just basically in this one box. We have to remark upon it because it's unusual. Meanwhile, Pinterest, Facebook, Twitter continue to grow. The blogosphere, almost no one talks about, in part because it's kind of absorbed the background hum of human consciousness. We actually have a scholarly problem with trying to see how big the blogosphere is, because we're talking about hundreds of millions of blogs in all kinds of languages, from Chinese to Farsi to English. The social media world continues to grow. And in fact, 
We use social media for intimate, emotional, and storytelling purposes. If you haven't seen this, this is from a Tumblr site. Do you all know Tumblr? It's a blogging platform uh, aimed at people who are 14 years old, apparently. But anybody can use it. And in fact, the White House had a Tumblr in 2012 and used it to collect digital stories for its campaign. But this is a Tumblr called We Are the 99%. And if you haven't seen it, it's a great document for our time. It was active in 2009 and 2010, and this is what it looked like. Page after page of individuals holding up handwritten signs describing their thoughts about being part of the 99%. And then you can see a glimpse of the person themselves. So you can see here a young woman, and you can just make out part of her face and her hand, and she's written, my dad died from cancer at the age of 44. We were still paying off his law school loans. We are the 99%. And if you ever think that technology is too geeky for real life, if you think it's boys' toys, if you think it's unhuman in a way, stories like this show that we've already decided that technology is as human as it gets. We continue to see a few other trend lines, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. Crowdfunding keeps growing. Copyright battles keep going because the movie industry and the music industry, and now increasingly the print publishers, love suing us. We see that Moore's Law keeps working. We keep seeing memory get bigger and cheaper, and we keep seeing processing speed get faster and faster. And we are increasingly migrating from Microsoft Office, from the desktop office, to the web. Now, I haven't mentioned mobile devices because it's kind of a cliche, but let's just see a quick show of either hands or devices. How many of you are using an iPhone? How many of you are using an Android phone? Yeah, 50-50. How many of you are using a Blackberry? <laughs> wow! Just, just look around the room. Brave person. <laughs> a woman, if, are you Canadian? No? Okay. It's a Canadian product. It's a powerful one. Um, but think about what just happened, right? Uh, we're, anybody using a Windows phone? All right. That's a good phone. It's a really good phone. It came out too late, but it's a good phone. Smartphones have obviously uh, taken over in huge areas in the United States. In fact, one of the things that's happened, and you can tell, if you don't use your phone for a lot, is you can tell that phones have taken over by looking at web page design. Increasingly, web pages are looking simpler. And that's not because they think you're stupid. Well, that's what CNN does, but, and, but nobody else. It's because they think you're likely to view the web page on a smaller device. So instead of having four columns and multiple lines, they'll be with one big fat image or video and then one fat column below that because they think you're looking at it on a smartphone or a tablet. So already we're beginning to design web content from mobile devices before anything else. In fact, it's possible we're in the post-PC era. We still use personal computers, just not as often and not as much. In fact, the mouse and keyboard, that classic, awesome paradigm of computing is beginning to fade. It's not our main way of using computers. We swipe, we gesture, we talk. I mean, that is a huge transition in how we interact with information. We see 3D printing. Ah, don't have enough time to talk about that, but 3D printing is just erupting everywhere, and economists are worried that we may slow down globalization because we can print things that we used to buy from East Asia. One bit of technology that isn't taking off is 3D TV. People thought it would be great, especially for sports, and it's going nowhere. Now, mobile devices also continue ramifying in all kinds of ways. This is a cute chart from Gartner where they asked people in a poll, where on your body would you like to have a mobile device? And it's kind of funny to think about in a tongue-in-cheek way. You know, embedded in jewelry, glasses, clothing, shoe, wrist, clo uh, tattoo, my favorite one, contact lenses around chests. Each of these exists right now. Right? We have taken computing and distributed it all over our body. I mean, intimate computing is really where we are and where we're going even more and more rapidly. Interesting sign. Uh, anybody here work in the library world? Awesome. I knew this is a library table because it was cool. And I knew it was. So this is thing that you guys have to work with, which is a challenge. Libraries used to, among other things, provide the service of owning lots of content, of owning lots of books, of owning lots of records, VHS tapes, and all of this. They're decreasingly doing this because as a society, we are moving more towards streaming content rather than towards owning physical copies of content. 
So these guys are increasingly either literally streaming or they're taking care of licenses for things that aren't there, like JSTOR. Right? As you can tell from you know, charts like this, we are buying fewer and fewer DVDs and just we're happy to access things through streaming. And if this doesn't make sense to you, consider how many people here listen to music on Rhapsody or Last FM or on Pandora, just like radio. You don't own it, but that's okay. Access is enough. Ebooks rapidly conquered the world and then stopped. They seem to have conquered the world of casual reading, of entertainment reading. They redefined pornography for the human race. If you don't know what I'm talking about, ask me later. If you do know what I'm talking about, just blush. Think Fifty Shades of Grey and you've got it. Um, in fact, if you don't believe me, go take a look at the Amazon ebook bestseller list. You will learn a lot about human psychology from that. But they have not taken over the world of serious reading, that is, of, say, scholarly reading. We have, in fact, a kind of split right now between ebooks and P print books. We're kind of stuck with that. That may be the bimodal distribution of the future. Now, the Horizon Report that I've been working on for a while wants you to think about a couple more technologies ahead of us. One is the idea of the quantified self. That is, we generate data. We make a kind of data exhaust just by being on Earth, just by moving around. Well, we can use that data for stuff. I was showing some of you yesterday that I have a version of the Fitbit here in my wrist which tracks my, uh, and you guys all have versions of this, I'm sure? Yeah. If you don't know what this is, this is a tiny computing device, pretty durable, and it tracks my footsteps and how much sleep I get. And then I plug this into my phone and it coughs up histograms and charts galore so I can figure out when I slept, how far I walked. There are other devices that track other things. In fact, a new headphone set has earpieces that go in your ears and while they're there, they monitor your heartbeat and your heart rate because you can't monitor that from the outside of your body very easily. We are increasingly quantifying who we are and what we do and there are more and more technologies that let us do this. We're also happy with virtual assistants. Now, the Horizon Reporter, a bunch of Mac flunkies, so they absolutely love Siri and will use it for anything. But it's true. Remember back in the day, Clippy from Microsoft Office? You know, we hated Clippy very much. It's changed. We now like our virtual assistants. We're happy to talk to our devices and have them give us advice. Now, whoops. Two things I thought would happen that didn't. One was there was talk that we had reached the top of the web that we were making so much digital content that wasn't web-based that we would stop being web creatures. It hasn't happened. We still use it. There was also talk about four years ago that we would start onshoring American digital hardware production, that instead of using East Asia as America's factory, that we would bring things into the U.S. And that hasn't worked out. Now, let's take these two giant categories of technology and education and cram them together and see what they actually tell us. Uh, this cartoon, by the way, is a French cartoon from 1900. It's a vision of teaching and learning in the year 2000. Uh, it's kind of fun, so it's a post-Jules Verne you know, vision. And you can see it gets some things actually right. You have a uh, student labor there on the right, you know, student worker who's busy at digitization. I mean, it's an analog form of digitization, but it's there. And you get a bunch of students looking kind of, well, mostly unhappy or sleepy. And that's not too far off from the year 2000. <laughs> Uh, but you can tell it's got some kind of fun things of turning books into electrical impulses which somehow go directly into the brain. You've got Keanu Reeves going, I know Kung Fu, right there. <laughs> so there are a bunch of trends that you guys all live with, so I'll be very quick with this. Uh, one of them is the blended classroom, the blended learning or flipped classroom, which just keeps growing. People like this idea very much. Most of the provosts, presidents, trustees I talk to like the idea of combining the best of the digital world with the best of the face-to-face -face world, and that seems to be a happy thing. The net generation, we can talk about people who are teenagers right now as digital natives. We can overstate how familiar they are with digital technology. But A, most people believe this story. And B, there's a lot of truth in it. If you take a look at studies of who uses what devices, there's a pretty clear generational arc where if you say, do you use social media? Do you game? Do you use this? Do you use that? If you're 14 to 18, odds are you use it, whatever it is. If you're 65 and up, the odds are that you don't use it, and you can pretty much steadily trace this. There are two technologies that only adults and older people use, by the way. One of them is podcasts, and the other one is LinkedIn. So if you're ever feeling generation gap by kids, cling to those. And you can say, ha ha, you don't do this, that's pretty good. 
We also have uh, distance learning growing. Obviously, I don't need to tell you guys this, but distance learning continues to grow. We don't necessarily call it distance learning. We call it online learning. I mean, MOOCs are distance learning. No one says that. But these keep growing in quantity and adoption. We also see gaming begin to grow further in education. I was studying this back in 2004, and I thought this might conquer the world. It stopped dead in its tracks in 2008 with the recession. But then it started to creep back. So we're seeing games, we're seeing game studies, and we're also seeing gamification. And we're also seeing me abuse this mouse like crazy. So a few other trends that, again, you're probably familiar with. I'll just touch on a couple of these. The maker movement keeps growing, which is interesting. The maker movement is analog based, although it relies on digital technology. It's not institutionally based, but people love this. They love being able to work with macrame or wood or plastic or build robots. They like being able to go to a shop and just bang on stuff and learn. And in fact, we're seeing government support for this. The White House keeps holding little maker meetings. The state of California has been giving millions of dollars uh, away to maker spaces. And colleges that I've talked to love the idea of setting up a maker space. Have you guys thought about putting one in one of your libraries yet? Yes, see, of course. Librarians are always ahead of the rest of us. It is true. I'm not kidding. Watch for maker spaces. Uh, a couple other ones here. Digital humanities started off as a research one enterprise from you know, the University of Pennsylvania or from UVA. It migrated to state schools, then it migrated to liberal arts colleges, and now it's down to community college level. So the humanities as a field are becoming gradually more digital. We're also seeing social media being used in education. And it's funny because it's often used in the margins. We don't see many campuses openly own and support, say, a blogging engine. Most don't right now. But we do see lots of people using social media, students, staff, and faculty. MOOCs are absolutely enormous. And there's all kinds of things we can say about MOOCs. And you can help blame me for one if you hate them, because I'm one of the guys who coined the term. I'm sorry. Uh, if you're a computer gamer, you should know that I was thinking of massively multiplayer online games. So massively open online classes is what I was thinking of. So MOOCs, as you know, I don't want to explain what they are, are running into all kinds of challenges and issues. They're migrating away from higher education. We're seeing MOOCs right now for K through 12. We're seeing MOOCs aimed at corporate training. We're seeing the problem of sustainability. No one knows how to keep paying for MOOCs. Well, I and mean, we have bad ways. Uh, one way is for governments to pour money on them. So we're seeing governments like the Brazilian government, we're seeing the European Union, we're seeing China pour money on MOOCs. That's not really sustainable, but it's there. We don't know how to pay for them. Yale's former president just took over one of the big MOOC platforms. He might figure out a way to do this. We're also seeing credit not happening. People take MOOCs and they stay in the MOOC sphere. They don't cross over to anywhere else. How many of you guys have finished a MOOC, by the way? Quick show of hands. Very good, very good, very smart people. How many of you have ever started a MOOC and, yeah, okay. If you haven't done either of those things, please do. The MOOC experience is a bit like the Matrix. You can't really be told what it is, you have to poke at it. Uh, I recommend looking at a C MOOC as well as an X MOOC. An X MOOC are the MOOCs we usually think of, the big ones generated by schools like Stanford or Harvard, the ones that have 100,000 people, lots of video pushed out. The C MOOCs are the ones that are smaller, merely 10,000 people. They're often based in social media and tend to be very constructivist. DS-106 from the University of Mary Washington is a good example of that. Scholarly publishing. I'm sorry, Table, I do not have enough time to talk about this. It's such a rich topic, but you guys all probably know or you should know that there is a deep war being fought in scholarly publication because we have the print publishers, the proprietary publishers, who keep jacking up the rent, basically. They're making a fortune. If you want to make some quick cash, buy Elsevier now. It, they're doing fabulously, and they live in desperate fear of the rest of us who keep producing open access content available online. And that war is being fought in Congress, it's being fought in state legislatures, it's being fought on campus after campus, and that keeps growing. Some people think the end of this war will be open access wins, and companies like Elsevier just go out of business and die. Some think we'll see a kind of modus vivendi, like with e-books and print books. Some think the good guys, sorry, the open will lose. This is where we are right now, in the battlefield. Now, if you wrap a bunch of these trends together, uh, they do form a kind of mega trend, if you will. And one of them is the idea of a higher education bubble. Now, there are other terms for this. Uh, I have published, in fact, in a different term, which I call peak higher education. And here are some of the components of it. Now, a bubble is when you have some good 
like tulips or houses that people go crazy about. They throw money in, the prices go up, we go crazier about them, it becomes a mania, and then suddenly we say, oh, wait, that's bullshit. And then we back away and the whole thing collapses. And we, bullshit's a technical term for macroeconomics, by the way. It doesn't really work anymore and it collapses. And you all know this from bitter experience of the 2008 housing bubble. And for history, if you want the best one ever, it was the Dutch tulip bubble. If you don't know about that, Google it and start chortling. Enjoy your anti-Dutch feelings to the max. It may be that higher education has reached that point. Think. Our costs haven't been going down, right? They've been going up and up and up. And we've had more and more people going into education. We've had more and more desire to get into higher education. But now we are at this point where we're terrified of the cost. And we're also skeptical of the value. I mean, there are books like Academically Adrift, which you, if you haven't read it, you really should, because it's very, very important for our time. It's controversial, but there's a lot of documents, and not just fluff pieces, criticizing what higher education manages to achieve. We're also seeing the cost worry really begin to blossom. Furthermore, students and parents are not happy with debt. I mentioned debt before. Debt is enormous right now. And we're actually seeing macroeconomic side effects of student debt, that is, we're seeing people in their 20s, traditional age college students graduating, burdened with debt, not buying houses. One analyst estimated that the American housing market is down about 9% right now because of that. That same population is also less likely to marry, less likely to have children. So guess what? Remember that demographic bubble or the demographic problem of having fewer K through 12 kids? We're gonna have fewer K through 12 kids 20 years from now. So this is a huge crisis to think about. Meanwhile, some grad schools, uh, anybody here in law school? No, because they're busy trying not to kill themselves. Because law schools are entering a terrible crisis. I know it's almost impossible to feel any sympathy for lawyers, but try this for a second. <laughs> law schools are shedding tenured faculty. The total number of students in law schools has been going down for the past four years. There's talk of law schools being closed. They're getting bonds degraded to junk level. And it's a real nightmare for law schools right now, and it's going to get worse. Business schools have plateaued instead of growing. Other grad schools are having problems. Plus, something else to think about politically. Whatever your political orientation, doesn't matter. It used to be in American culture that there was a kind of traditional show where the Republicans would say, we need to cut spending on education. The Democrats would say, we need to keep spending. The Republicans would say, we need to stop teachers' unions. The Democrats would say, we need to keep teachers' unions. Back and forth, back and forth reliably until 2008. Now, they tend to agree. Oh, this hasn't happened before. I mean, you ask the Democrats, they say, well, we need to get rid of teachers' unions, stop them. We need to spend less money on education. And higher education doesn't know what it's talking about, and we will fix it by government fiat. That's a tricky spot for us to be in. Well, maybe, maybe this isn't the bubble after all. I mean, the amount of student debt is scary, but about a third of students don't have any, which is remarkable. A bunch of students don't graduate and have debt. That may be more of a problem of completion. And on top of that, the amount of debt, we're talking roughly 30,000 for the two thirds that have it, it's high, but it's not impossible. And it ties into the fact that if you graduate with a college degree as opposed to a high school degree, the amount of money you make in your life looks like it's about 500,000 roughly more than it would be. Well, $500,000, 30,000 debt is a bargain for getting that premium. So it may be that right now, college is still a good deal. Plus, for private institutions, I know it doesn't count for you guys, but for about a third of American higher education, endowments are beginning to come back. Now, those are a bunch of trends. I've been throwing these at you, hurling them in your brain, because I want to make sure that as you think about the future, you have the present in mind, because that's where the future comes from. With your mind buzzing about them, I want to shift ground to a second futures method. And these are scenarios. A scenario is a story about the future. It's a hypothetical. What if X and Y happen? You know, what if we have a, a nuclear crisis? What if we have a meltdown of a major nuclear power plant in the United States? How does that change things? What if we get nanotechnology working at the consumer level? How does that change things? That's what a scenario is. If you have time, you can role play them. 
In fact, one of the exercises I love doing is giving scenarios to different people and saying, how does your job change in the next 10 years under this scenario? That's a lot of fun to do. These aren't predictions of the future. These are vehicles for getting you to think about the future and to think about it in a more practical way. However, normally, I try to show a balanced mix of scenarios, a happy one, a sad one, a weird one, and one that looks kind of like today. Normally, I try to do that. But today, I have decided that you are too cheerful. <laughs> it's homecoming, everything is happy. So I want to scare you. And in part because I think, in all seriousness, that higher education, in general, isn't scared enough about where we are. So my way of doing that is to show you four dystopias. What is dystopia? The word comes from made up. Really? It's on your jacket. Oh, that was dumb. Uh, <laughs> I am just too hot. Is that better? Bear with me. I know, I know. That's too much to worry about. You know, I'll do it. All right, all right, I'll do it. So the word utopia is a made-up synthetic word. It doesn't exist in any language except English. Thomas More invented it in 1516. How many of you have read Utopia? Good. I recommend it. If you haven't read it, it's a weird book. It's a kind of science fiction, political economy fantasy. Um, and the word itself, utopia, is a pun in Greek. In Greek, there's two sounds for you. One sound is you, E-U, like euphemy or eulogy. That means sweet or good. There's also U, which means no or not. Topus means place. So a utopus is a sweet place, a good place. And utopus is no place. In English, we don't have that subtle differentiation, U-U. So it's just utopia, the sweet no place, the good place that doesn't exist. It's a nice pun. Utopias are that. They're imaginations of sweet places, of what they could be like. Now, dystopia. Well, in English, we all know dis is not a good word. It's bad. It's a bad place, an awful place. And dystopias are very popular right now. If you guys read young adult literature, if you see movies, you know that we're crazy for dystopias. They're all kinds. Uh, they tend to be based on current trends extrapolated into the future. So for example, Charles, uh, George Orwell's 1984 was aimed to depict the world of 1948. What would happen if Soviet-style state communism came to Britain? So you take the present and extrapolate it. How many of you have read Yevgeny Zemyatin's classic novel, We? Oh, excellent. Andrew is a man to pay attention to. This is a novel from the 1920s, a terrific, terrific novel. What if we go too far in pursuit of rationality? A lot of dystopias are like that. And they tend to be total systems that you can't escape. Now, in young adult fiction, now we have tons of these. The Hunger Games. If you haven't read The Uglies Trilogy by Scott Westerfeld, I really recommend it. Lots of these. I mean, in part, they describe the grimness and horror that people feel of being teenagers, but also they tie into all kinds of other forces. And there are darker worlds. Teen dystopias actually end often on a positive note. Someone becomes heroic and succeeds. Classic dystopias usually don't. They end badly. Famous last line, 1984, he loved Big Brother. But always remember that one dystopia is somebody else's utopia. It makes somebody happy. So if you think about, say, the Handmaid's Tale, a terrible, terrible world, but happy for the elite. Always remember that. Someone's dystopia makes somebody happy. So what can happen in higher education? Here are four dystopias, four bad places. The first one's called Silos Standing Tall. The second one is a cyberpunk world. The third is a gilded age. And the fourth is a bubble bursting. So the first, information silos, imagine this five or 10 years from now, dominate the world. All of our content is located in closed information architectures. All of our teaching, same way. All research is produced in individual containers that can't be publicly accessed. Open source software is largely gone. 
global conversations fragment out into different pieces because you can only talk on Skype with other people who talk on Skype. You can only talk on FaceTime with other Mac users. You can only talk on Alibaba with other Alibaba users. So instead of having a global seething network, we have a whole bunch of striations. The filter bubble, that is the idea that you get into Google and it shows you certain things, it doesn't show you other things, happens everywhere. On campuses, the price of information so the price of software, the price of scholarly journals is higher and higher and higher. Faculty are trained to live in these stacks. So when you publish something, it becomes a matter of, of style and ranking to say, what devices can access your article? Who is that publisher? IT departments are all massively trained in different silos. So you have the iOS expert, you have the Windows expert, you have the Android expert, you have the Elsevier expert. Academic content is barely available to the rest of the world. Also, uh, the learning management system dominates the campus. This is where you enter, this is where you experience teaching and learning. And the library is not known as a place of reference access. The library is not known as a place to study and work. It's known as a purchasing agent and as your guide to moving between silos. Now, this might make some people happy. Content industry, I mentioned radio, I'm sorry, I mentioned movies, music, and print publishers, they're happy, they survive. This is the bulwark that keeps them going. Also, there's some content that's wonderfully high quality. One of the reasons iTunes is so successful is because it curates the content inside of it. Some technologies, like video conferencing, really succeed in this way. And malware is scarce. You guys all know the Beloit mindset list? You get this every year, it comes out from Beloit's English department. You may have been emailed it and not known it, where it's a list of things that 18 year olds know and don't know. Right? It's, it's partly tongue in cheek, but not bad. Right? You know, so the Warsaw Pact is an alien thing to them, like the Congress of Vienna, that kind of thing. So imagine what the 18 year old world is like for someone in the world of silos. What it's like to be 18 in that world. So for them, the internet has always meant a series of walled gardens. For them, the web has always been commercial. And they identified with the stack. They embraced Microsoft or Google by age 15. Different world. Set that aside. In the 1980s, 1990s, there was a science fiction movement called cyberpunk. Has anyone here read or seen any of those stories? Wild, crazy science fiction. Imagine a future where corporations are extremely powerful, governments survey private citizens, there are rebels who use technology to get back at the governments, and there's technology everywhere. Crazy, <laughs> isn't it? Wild. <laughs> Science fiction, right? So imagine that this world is what we live in. The screenshot, by the way, is from Blade Runner. So this is a world which is saturated with technology, and it's also a chaotic world, not a stable one. It's one that's hyper-globalized, where globalization is just racing at top speed. It's one that's deeply, deeply networked and technology is ubiquitous, network technology. Surveillance is totally normative. People are accustomed to this everywhere they go, from driving to being in the hospital. And it happens from corporations, and it happens from governments. States, governments, are destabilized in this world. Corporations are a bit more powerful because they're a bit more stable, a bit more secure. In this world, companies really own a large part of the regulatory process. This is something in finance that we call regulatory capture, where those that are regulated capture the ones that regulate them. And they influence policy. We have subversion by technology, and the future just keeps changing. We keep getting new devices all the time. Continuous future shock. Work is a little chaotic, a little disorganized. Sometimes we have forced labor. Unemployment is high, and one of the reasons is because automation is so high. We have so much automation that we have, we've replaced work effectively. We haven't generated more jobs. Campuses look a little different. Tuition is entirely private. Campuses are supported by private individuals. We have more and more endowed parking lots, endowed buildings, endowed scholarships. Campuses largely depend on the beneficial thoughts of wealthy people. Majors that are especially powerful are business, STEM programs, and Homeland Security. We have micropayments for everything on campus, getting into your LMS for printing. We have metrics for everything on campus based on business. How will this impact the bottom line? There's also greater military presence on campus. ROTC is bigger, 
more military scholarships, more veterans. And information literacy is vital in this world because things are so chaotic. 18-year-old in the cyberpunk world, what's that like? Well, they identified with a company by age 15. They also think that half of their social network is not from America. Half of their social network is planetary. And also, they have serious technology training by middle school. Let's put this aside. Put the cyberpunk world aside. Think Downton Abbey 2.0. What I'd like you to imagine 10 years from now is we live in an age of massive inequality and it's all shiny and stable. The inequality has shot up. The 1% and the 1% of the 1% are enormously wealthy. The rest of us, well, we watched their conspicuous consumption, partly by social media. Reality shows, yes, but we love following the Pinterest of the wealthy so we can just imagine what it must be like. And in fact, most labor is now not just in service, but also in service. Have you all seen the Alfred Club that launched last week? You guys all know TaskRabbit? Alfred just won an award from Silicon Valley, its highest award basically for innovative entrepreneurship. And Alfred is a service of servants. You can immediately plug in and demand an Alfred come to your house and do you some service. Washing your clothes, folding your laundry, cooking food, taking out the garbage, whatever you like. You can do this on demand. This is massively capitalized and massively invested in. That's the future in this future, where we are servants in effect. Automation is widespread, of course. In politics, we have something like a gerontocracy. The reason for this is because, as we know from economics, capital tends to trickle up in age. The older tend to be holding more capital. And the more you hold capital, the more it grows. So we, in effect, have the AARP being the most powerful lobby in the United States. We also have the unemployed not rioting. Again, think about Downton Abbey which is, among other things, a lesson in how to live in inequality. The unemployed are pacified because they have rich social media and perhaps guaranteed minimum income. Campuses? Well, campuses look a little bit like Downton Abbey. 99% of the faculty are adjunct, often moving from campus to campus. Some have actually called this a neo-feudal campus. The emphasis of campus is on rich students, because they pay, and they are the wealthy who run the place. Distance learning is for the middle class, MOOCs are for everybody else. Elite schools offer a liberal arts education. If you are wealthy, one way to tell is because you don't have any visible technology. Technology is for the help. And the majors that are most popular are finance, human resources, political science. These are the ways that you study to maintain the order. Being 18 year old in this world, well, in the Gilded Age, you follow the 1% closely. You know their lives. You follow celebrities. They are meaningful. And you've contributed to the sharing economy by age 10. And the term middle class is as historical to you as the Crusades. Scenario four, you're not laughing so much now. This is good. Scenario four, the bubble bursts. We have passed peak higher education. What does this mean? Well, the demographic decline, we talked about that before, accelerated prices and sunk costs. Sunk costs, that is, we have lots of buildings and physical campuses, and we have lots of guaranteed employment in the form of tenure that we have to keep paying. Plus, public funding, I don't have to tell you this, keeps shrinking. Imagine it hitting zero, where public institutions are effectively private. Plus, in this future, we have alternatives that keep rising. One reason is, in this future, education's reputation declines. Think about the widespread hatred of K through 12 right now. Imagine that extending to higher education. Homeschooling keeps growing. We don't like talking about it, but it's huge. It keeps growing. And we have informal learning that is now really good, and for a lot of people considered to be good enough for higher ed. And research in this world comes from corporations and from governments. Enrollment collapsed, like I mentioned. Campuses look empty. They have fewer students. They're smaller because they've sold off buildings and real estate. The student body is something like 50% international because that's where the students are. And there are lots of low-cost programs, like a $10,000 BA degree. Research has really shrunk. Tenure is a rarity. And information support IT library is largely outsourced. 
for an 18-year-old in this grim world, well, for them, vocational classes are back. That's how they really school themselves in K through 12. They're used to apprenticeships to get into a career. And for them, colleges have always meant transnational. Colleges are, are incredibly cosmopolitan places. Four not so happy visions of the future. One of silos, one of cyberpunk, one of gilded age, and one of a bubble being burst. Now, you might want to know, is there a way out of this place? Yeah, and here are a few ways. I'm going to tell you a few, and I want to know what you think. How much time do we have? That's a good answer. <laughs> Politics may be a solution. You may decide that higher education needs to change its political profile. You may decide to lobby for increased government funding. Now, we've been doing that, but we've failed miserably. We've backfired. We have less. So we need to do something for that. Government could be state, could be federal. Adjunct organization. I don't know the politics on your campus, so I'm just saying this as an outsider. There's a growing movement now to unionize adjuncts in order to argue for greater compensation and support. That's another way to improve the status of adjuncts. You also may want to fight for broader economic policies. If you're concerned about the collapse of the middle class, there are responses to this. Perhaps you want to argue for more exploitation of the Marcellus Shale. Perhaps. Because that leads to jobs that actually pay better than nothing. Perhaps you want to argue for redistributive policies at the federal government tax level. These are options. For technology, using social media may be a good way out. It may be a way to avoid the silo world. It's a good way to organize and to share your thoughts. If you're afraid of closed or proprietary information, you may want to instead use open content as much as possible. And in fact, you may want to own your data as much as possible. Uh, University of Mary Washington has an initiative for students called the Domain of One's Own, where every 18-year-old lands on campus and gets their own URL, and they host it. Maybe you want that. Now, on campus, thinking about the future, using these techniques, thinking about trend analysis, thinking about scenarios, to try and think ahead, to beat these dystopias before they come to you. You also may want to uh, teach privacy. Ah, you guys teach privacy, I know, I know. But for everyone to teach privacy and teach it seriously, and teach practices, maybe technologies. Think, imagine teaching how to use a Tor browser, <coughs> teaching encryption to first year students. Just think about these possibilities. And on top of this, nurture public intellectuals. Because right now in higher education, our public intellectuals are largely not visible. We have very little presence in TV, zero in radio, barely anything in print. Our public intellectuals are terrific in social media. We need to do more. I mean, we don't have a Carl Sagan right now representing higher education. We need more of those. Now, I've abandoned you in this forest. And I've shown you a couple of paths. Let me ask you, how do you escape these futures? What are a couple of ways you can do that? I'm a recovering English professor, by the way, so if you don't volunteer, I will call on you. How do we go forward and not have a dystopia like that? What do you want to do? I'm just going to cry instead. No, you must act, as your dean said. Librarians, what do we do? Besides listen to you guys and, and scream, that's okay. What else do we do? We show people how to use open source content. Oh, if you couldn't hear that, the answer was to show people how to use open source content. Brilliant. a greater emphasis on information literacy, because that puts the emphasis on you as a decider, as an integrator, as an investigator, rather than corporations. Good, good, yes? Understand the values inherent in the technology you choose. Uh, values of which technology? Under, understand the values inherent in the technology. Inherent, thank you. This is a bearded man, so you should listen to him. Um, <laughs> and I think you all heard him. So whatever the values are the technology expresses, that's good, that's subtle. Are you a humanist, by the way? I could tell, good. Yes, ma'am. Um, uh, so so awesome. Did you all hear that? So support net neutrality and for the deliberate classification of internet service providers as common carriers. 
so that they can not end up violating net neutrality and creating fast lanes and slow lanes for different things. Because that would be the cyberpunk world. Very good. No other ideas. Then, oh yes, please, Chris, right? Yes. Brilliant. Um, one way of doing that, I don't know if you follow the uh, Pew Internet and American Life Project, but they've been studying how Americans use mobile devices. And one of the interesting things is Latinos use mobile phones more than any other race, which is fascinating. And there are all kinds of reasons for this. So you think. If you want to reach out to the Latino population, maybe shove content towards mobile phones. Take a look at Twitter. Whites are the least likely race to use Twitter. So I think, well, maybe we should do more with Twitter. Brilliant idea, brilliant idea. I'm conscious of time. I'm getting a glare look from Bogus, which means I know it's the end. So what I want to do is uh, tell you that um, there's a federal regulation which says that every PowerPoint presentation ends with URLs. I'm sure you know this. Um, <laughs> So you can find, this is uh, my consulting site, you know, the giant bear, that's me. You can also find my blog, and you can find me on Twitter. Um, so I recommend doing that if you're curious. Um, if you're really sad, um, I applaud you for bearing up. I want you to think about this stuff. I want you to think about the possibilities. And I want you to continue building the terrific stuff that you do. This is, by the way, a sign of practice, of open practice. Uh, I have links to all the images that I used from the web. Uh, and these are not stolen because these are all links that are designed to be used by other people in an open way. Let me thank you for your attention and have some more coffee. <laughs>